we might get going. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here to chair this, uh, this Art of Sound Forum. But before we begin, I'd just like to say that uh, I'd like to acknowledge that today's Art of Sound Forum is being held on the country of the Darug people, of the Darug nation, and that we acknowledge their ancestors who have been traditional owners of their country for thousands of years. We in music at UWS also wish to acknowledge and pay our respect to the Darug people's elders, past and present. And it gives me great pleasure to now introduce our distinguished guest, Professor or Associate Professor Sean um, Heim, who is based at Chapman University. Um, he is a composer who has been emerging uh, on the international arena in the last uh, few, several years and has uh, some very distinguished accolades uh, that I'd just like to quickly trot through. Um, the fact that he is um, based at Chapman University uh, where he's the Associate Professor of Music and holds the 2010 to 12 Wang Fradkin Senior Professorship. Um, he's studied here at, uh, in Australia at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, but before that he studied with the uh, dis distinguished composer Chinnery Ung, who's at Arizona State University, and he holds a, a degree, in a PhD degree, uh, from uh, the University of Queensland. Um, I think what's really interesting for composers and what's really great for composers in this opportunity that we've got here uh, today, because um, one of the things that I think we can uh, often find happening is that we get kind of insular. We don't kind of know what's going on in the bigger world because we're really focused on only on the things that are going on around us. And I suppose what's kind of really interesting is that uh, composition is something that, that spreads out all over the, the world and of course um, sound is out there for the taking for, for someone who's a composer. And I guess what's kind of interesting is then how does one deal with the sounds that are out there for the taking? What, you know, the idea that you've got a personal language, how does that personal language kind of come about? And um, how do you develop a kind of uh, compositional aesthetic, um, you know, when you perhaps are born and bred as a Westerner, but you really start to become interested in music from other cultures? And so where do these things come and meet each other. And I guess that the thing that's kind of really interesting to read in, in Sean's um, uh, biography um, is that he strives to go below the mere surface representation of cultural confluence and centers his work on the deeper truths uh, that are found in the commonality of human spirit. And I guess that's the thing that's, that really sets a composer apart, isn't it? It's the thing that uh, when they're kind of really authentically finding their voice and, and then being able to project that voice in that way that kind of rings true to those of us who are listening, that's when composition really does its thing. Um, I think that we'd all agree with that. I think just finally I just want to say that um, uh, Sean Heim has received numerous <coughs> prizes, awards, honours and commissions from such prestigious institutions as the Fromm Foundation at Harvard, the National Endowment for the Arts, Meet the Composer, the American Music Centre, the Atlantic Centre for uh, Arts, the American Composer Forum uh, and the a ASCAP Foundation, including Rudolf Nissen Prize. So he's actually got a string of really impressive awards. His music has been performed critical acclaim throughout the United States and abroad, and uh, performers like Ear Unit, Piano Spears, Ensemble Green, the Focus Festival at uh, Juilliard, Thailand International Composition Festival, Inauthentica, Topology, the Aurus uh, gr Group uh, for New Music, Perihelion, there were two from Brisbane I've just named, and the New York Miniaturist Ensemble. And so I think that uh, without any further ado, Sean, 
Um, I'd really like to hand over to you. I think the way it's going to be structured is that Sean will talk for a while, tell you about his music, we'll have a little talk about it, uh, and then uh, possibly, you know, talk a bit more yeah. about it and okay. so on. So we're going to kind of just make it fairly loose. Right. Wander up here so I can be archived. Thank you. I'm usually pretty loud, so I don't need a microphone, but I've got a bit of the hay fever, so it might be good. Uh, Bruce just finally gave me a sheet with what I'm going to do on it, so that's good. It gives me over five minutes to actually prepare, which I think is quite helpful. Uh, I, um, I think, as uh, Sally said, I deviate from the format just a little bit, and I think what I'd like to do is maybe tell you just a few things about my work in general and about myself and how it's evolved and then get right into maybe play a piece and then we can discuss it a bit and then uh, hopefully we'll have time to tell you a little bit more about another piece and play that one and discuss that one. So instead of leaving all the talk for the end, I think we'll just have a conversation along the way as we go. Uh, hopefully that'll be all right with everyone. Um, I'm not sure there's much you can do about it. <laughs> I think I'm in control actually. So. It's good. So yeah, I think, uh, thank you, first of all, uh, to Sally and Bruce and everyone else on the panel for having me here and the uh, Durek Nation. That's very nice of you to thank the uh, Native people. Uh, I have Native American background myself, so I find those things uh, respectful and appropriate. Um, and I really can't thank you enough for having me here uh, for the next couple of days. I uh, say I went to school in uni in Queensland, so I... I've been to Australia, this is my fifth time in Australia, so I'm pretty familiar with the place, and, uh, uh, but happy to be here in Western Sydney. Um, yeah, so as a composer, well, what does, what does that mean, I guess? And I think, like many composers, I started as a performer, and I was an electric guitar player, played in rock bands and the like, studied jazz for several years, got interested in progressive rock, started listening to bands like Genesis and Yes and Emerson Lake and Palmer and all these things which may predate many of you but hopefully you've discovered some of these things on your own because it's really some fantastic music. And then eventually in the Mahavishnu Orchestra and John McLaughlin and people like that and as a guitar player and so but what happened was I began to broaden my horizons to listening to the music that those people have been influenced by which was obviously you know music from uh, the art music scene, classical music scene as we call it. Um, and I went to university to study guitar and I just, after a while, found out that I just wasn't interested in playing other people's music as much as I was interested in playing my own, which I'd always kind of done. So I began studying composition and at some point during my studies, I had uh, learned that uh, I had some Native American background in my own family. And I think that kind of started getting me interested in other music of other cultures. And I kind of started there with kind of studying some Native American music with famous Native American composer Lewis Ballard for a while and then moved on. And, and it branched out to a lot of other cultures, which led me to study with Chinnery Young and many other people. And, uh, and I think I worked that way for quite a bit. And actually, I think tomorrow in a class, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that music. But I think at some point along the path, I started realizing that uh, I guess for me, culture is a bit of a surface emanation of, of who we are really as human beings, who we are as people, as societies and cultures. So to pay, there's obviously there's a lot of factors in there that we can't uh, possibly discuss in a one hour lecture. But so we produce a culture out of many types of conditions and how we live our lives and how we interrelate with other people and our environment and many other things. And I became much more, I guess focused in my work towards thinking about getting into the roots much more, into the soil of these types of things and finding out what are those common commonalities and how they go along. And I, so I started to move into some pretty esoteric territory, I think, and um, but certainly no territory that composers hadn't been in before. Um, and what I started to find was when I was doing Confluence of Culture and I was influenced by you know, Javanese music or Cambodian music or Japanese music. It was, there were very tangible things to grab a hold there, whether it be structure or just types of scales and things like that. And that's all quite easy to imitate. Um, but I think moving more towards the idea of assimilating things is in a way that was, number one, culturally appropriate, because I think just 
lifting things out of another culture is really a kind of um, musical tourism in a bit of a way, you know? So I think you have to think about it in, uh, and make it relevant to your own experience and your own culture. I think it's Bartok who said, you just, the best thing you can do with music from other places is just listen to it. And as you absorb it into your person and who you are, it'll just come out in the music you write anyway. So you don't really need to consciously and put a lot of effort into imitating something. Um, uh, so I guess where I'm going with this is that I started to get below those types of things and move into the field of kind of human experience, the human condition. I've taught some lecture, lecture courses on creativity and the human condition. And I, I think I've actually learned more from teaching them than I actually have uh, studying the material just from students in the class. And it's, it's pretty interesting how people define what it means to, to be a part of the human condition. I think for me, I always boil it down to the fact that we're eventually going to die and we're aware of it. You know what I mean? Which is, I guess, kind of heavy, but it's true. So we do many things in our lifetimes with that always kind of in, our, in the back of the mind, you know? And I think creativity in some ways is driven from that, that sense that at one point we, we won't be here any longer. So what's left behind? And, um, and going on from that, I moved into a state of looking at things at a more emotional level. So the first piece I wanted to play for you, uh, I have real fancy background here, it looks good on the screen, I have to say. Uh, it's called No Quarter. It's a string quartet um, I wrote in 2010, I believe. And for that piece, I was just, it started with actually very strong imagery. You know, I, and I'll be uh, straight up front with you, when I was a kid, I was, and still am, obsessed with pirates. I grew up on the east coast of the United States, which is, there's a lot of pirate things going on there, in the Caribbean and places, you know it from movies and things like that. Um, so I remember just an image once of some pirate things. And, and so I started to trace out the piece and think about these visual things. And at some point in the piece, I've just made a conscious decision. I said, this can't be about visuals at this point, because um, it's very difficult to relay visual information in a musical language. Um, so what I realized was that these visuals, for me, are just these things I thought about. you know. Like, dark scenes at night, you know, kind of in broken ships and things lost at sea. And, but they evoke, they're evocative of feelings, right? Or responses or reactions that I was having. And I said, okay, so what I want to do is I want to write music about the reactions and the things that are kind of beyond the visuals or deeper in the visuals. And the problem I found was there's really, it's a difficult thing to translate into music because music is a language that's unto itself. Now, I think historically that's probably uh, not 100% accurate, but for me, and that's all I can, I can only speak from my own experience, I can't speak for anyone else. I needed something to, as a go-between, so I began to use um, various analogs and ways to get across from visual scenes or from emotional scenes into a musical language. And many of the things I use actually draw from uh, physics and uh, mathematics and all kinds of different uh, equations. I'm by no means a physicist or a mathematician, I assure you. I use these things in a way that I think helps me to go to translate from something that's very uh, ethereal or esoteric. And then I find something perhaps that happens in physics with particle physics or something that has or encapsulate some of those same qualities, and then I can take what the math or what the structure or what the theory about those, uh, say, particle physics means, and that translates back into musical language because music and math are really actually kind of the same language if you go back to Pythagoras and start looking at it that way. So I began to find these ways through that I could actually come up with a musical language that was abstracted pretty far away from the original material initially, but then kind of came back to the original uh, ideas or inspirations through means of kind of transforming it through a different language. That's a lot to say before playing any music. So I think the next thing I'm going to do for you is actually play this string quartet. Um, like I said, it's really about uh, responses to human emotions. And at the time when I was writing the piece, I had a little bit of 
treachery in my life, which uh, is no stranger to anyone in the academic world. Sometimes things don't, <laughs> they all look good, and then all of a sudden you realize something had happened. And so I was kind of personally a bit put out by something and hurt by something. And as it, as it had it, that filtered into the work. So uh, it may be a little aggressive. It's also the first time I worked with some really large scale cycles, which I think I'll talk about before the next piece, where I put things into uh, kind of cycle, regenerating cycles that uh, change time and things. And also the first time I used like a really long coda in a, in a work. So this piece has a, I think the whole thing kind of actually builds towards the coda, as many pieces do that have significant ones. So uh, let me just play this for you and then we can chat a bit. Yeah. These are just kind of some plans that I go through and that's what the notation looks like. So if you look at that plan, it basically winds up looking something like that physically. But here we get to it. This is played by the Eclipse Quartet. There's a quartet in Los Angeles of uh, some reputation. So here we go.
That was it. <laughs> so I think it's you know just a kind of a, a breaking point for me where I kind of feel like I achieved a piece that was more about human emotion than principally anything else, um, which is a personal change, really. So I think now it's I guess question time. This is the hard part. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Um, before you said that with using, um, trying to create music with the use of images is quite difficult, so you went through to mathematics and physics, mm -hmm. how did you explore that with this particular piece? Uh, well, this one is just really actually kind of simple uh, numbers series and just kind of working with some kind of uh, irrational numbers and coming up with the numbers that come out and then planning events based on an irrational set of uh, plans. Uh, also, taking uh, actual long cycles of material, so there's two long cycles in the middle. So, let's just say it has 100 beats, and usually the marker of the cycle, like in Javanese gamelan or in Gagaku music, would happen every 15 beats. But what I would do over time is I would begin to compress it. So, 14, 13, you know, and down. So, and basically everything was hinged off of that marker as to when events happen. So the sooner they got together, the more things crunched over top of one another. So I created, a, it was a way of controlling density, which is kind of a bit similar to the way mass reacts in a space-time continuum field. And so, like I say, it's no direct thing where I'm sitting there doing complicated, amazing mathematics like Xenakis or something like that. But I, f I just find they're, I should put it this way, they're not kind of analytical ways to go through. I find them more as thought passages of ways to go through. So I just to kind of get myself out of thinking out of a directly visual, the musical type of way. I try to think it through other disciplines, you know, which I've done through, I mean, I think lots of different things in my life, whether it be, I think we've all done it with poetry or, you know, literature or visual elements. And for a long time, I was very influenced by um, visual arts. So, um, you know, particularly around the beginning of the turn of the 20th century into the Surrealist movement, and, and Max Ernst in particular and some other people. So I was just trying to find a way to fight my influences a little bit, if that makes sense, you know, because they, those people have such immense gravity they can really pull you into a way of thinking. And then how does that translate? So it became difficult for me, so I just went another way. Um, Sean, I mean, just uh, while we're talking about the music itself in that kind of way, I mean, for me, what comes through more than anything is Kind of post uh, serial kind of aesthetic. Would you agree that there's 
that there or not? I mean, uh, perhaps I'm just reading it on the surface as opposed to yeah, um, below the surface. I use some serial operations, but it's usually just it's never really any major structural thing or anything like that. Sometimes it's used to create random pitches. So I'm a little bit obsessed with not repeating things, I have to admit. So a lot of time I'll just use some procedures to, to uh, follow the old Schoenberg rule there of no repetition without transformation. You know? So I like to go through, but I don't approach anything on a, in a serial, you know, in that kind of aesthetic. I think, um, I think the benefit of living in the 21st century is that we've heard all those things and experienced all those things. So we can use a piece of, you know, of, of say, uh, serial music. We can use a piece of romanticism. We can use a piece of pointillistic music. I mean, we can I mean, kind I mean, of use what we want. Maybe I should just um, clarify what I mean, because I've actually put up fairly radical arguments in my book I wrote, which is that um, there are kind of, against the, the better judgment people, that there are kind of two main streams that have emerged since um, serialism and minimalism. Mm -hmm. And that is a kind of post-serialism and a post-minimalism. And I'm just wondering whether, uh, I mean, I'm sure that can be challenged and shot down, but, you know, I just wonder what you might sort of think of that kind of idea. Yeah. Well, I think we've been... <laughs> <laughs> I think we've been hit with a bit of mass individualism, in, in my opinion. And I always, when people say, "Are you a serial? You know, do you follow the European serial school of things?" I say, "Well, I use some serial things." And they say, "Well, what do you think of minimalist?" I say, "I'm a minimalist. I just don't repeat anything." Yeah. <laughs> I like. I use very minimal materials in my works, and there's no new material after about the third section in that whole piece. Everything is recycled through, and I, so, and. Even in newer works, like I'm writing a piece now, it's 19 minutes long, and it only uses four clusters in for the, to generate all the. So I'm really interested in the idea of generating the most out of the least amount of material. So it's kind of a minimalist idea, isn't it? I mean, you know, if we. So I think what happens is these things become fashion terms. Yeah. Minimalism becomes a fashion term, right, or a style term, when the truth is the techniques that are employed in it are, can be used by anyone, if, you know, depending on how you want to. But then your own voice has to come through it. Yeah. I guess I was having a scary moment at the time. I did this. <laughs> that happens to be the voice at the time, and I was I was fairly pleased with the, the fact that I thought it com it conveyed what my emotions were at the time. Yeah. I don't always feel like that. I'm usually happy. Yeah. <laughs> um, would you like to say something? Okay. Um, Please tell me how you can let the audience find and the sense your music help the uh, visual some things elements in your music. The visual elements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I I think in this one, I have a pretty good program note for it. So when it's performed, there's a program note, and there's there's actually six different scenes, and each one of the scenes in the piece has a title, and the title is very. Um, Evocative. You know, let me read you some of them because I think that'll probably be best. Give me some example. Uh, yeah, I'm, that's what I'm going to do. So, like, the first section I called the indeterminate night. So all that kind of screeching and it's almost uh, storm-like. And then the second part where it's kind of quiet and it's short melody, it's called something's creaking in the distance. You know, so I try to use kind of phrases to give the section's name. Um, the next one's called the air of death and rot, you know, like, so that's pretty extreme, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, farewell and adieu is the last section. And what I kind of reveal in the coda is that I've actually based all the melodic material on the piece on farewell and adieu to you fair Spanish ladies, the old the kind of, uh, uh, I guess you would say, sea shanty. Uh, but the reason I thought of it was in the movie Jaws, whenever there's a kind of major moment with the actual shark in the movie, uh, Quint is always singing farewell and adieu, and then it hits. So whenever you, it becomes kind of a trigger, so whenever you kind of hear that song, you know something's gonna, something's gonna happen, you know? Um, so yeah, I think it's difficult to evoke visual image, because I think everyone gets something different, you know? And I think in some ways I'm okay with people, 
listening to my music and getting what they get from it, and they don't necessarily need to understand what what I got from it. Because I think music and and a lot of art, I think it's about human response, right, to those things. And so, however people respond to it, well, that's what works for them. I think the more honest we are in the way we do it, the more people will understand what we put into it. But maybe just in a different way, through a different lens, you know, through different ears. Yeah. Does that answer your question? I think? Hope. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, so just picking up on, the, on that, that point, so you've got detailed program notes. Yeah. So you, you um, it, it, is that in an attempt to, to offer, I mean, that's your, your response to the question is, is for that as an offering to the audience to help mm -hmm. them to enter into your sound world guided by the description in your program notes. That's right. Yeah, and I, but I, so I do that because that's what most, it helps a lot of people, right? And I think we have to be realistic as composers of new music that uh, people are coming into uncharted territory a lot of the time, especially since everyone is such an individual. Everyone's music is so different. So I feel it's, uh, it's right to give them something to kind of hang on to. At the same time, I'll say I'm a person who goes to a concert and I don't read the program notes until after I've heard the piece because I actually prefer to kind of listen first and then go and see what the... And then, of course, I want to hear it again, you know, and you know, many things I want to hear multiple times because I think that's what it takes to actually to kind of understand it about it. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I spend a lot of time listening with my pen. I, yeah. Um, <laughs> try, try and keep, keep the experience, uh, you know, to be able to come back and uh, sort of concretize the experience. Come True. To, to True. Think, think of the piece in terms of the sections. And so what's interesting to me then is that I was not only listening through my pen, but listening through your preamble. Mm. Um, and so it's very interesting then to come back and listen to, to what you're saying about the content of the program notes, which puts all of that in quite stark contrast. Which I purposely left out of my preamble, as you might know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah because I didn't want to suggest too much. Yeah. But that's kind of my own, uh, my own thing. And I figure you know, most people in here have been exposed to a fair bit of things, so yeah. we'll see how it goes. But uh, yeah, and I think. I'm sure the program notes are out there somewhere. But uh, it doesn't say much more than just, and I, I list the titles you know, of the sections, but I don't say any more about them. They're just kind of like almost slightly poetic suggestions as to where you could go with the listening. Not, not very cheerful listening, but very engaging. I, did, I, have, writ I have written more cheerful. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this piece is 10 minutes, so it's good. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's a good length, so I think that's why. But I also think it's a significant piece because I, yeah, I kind of made a departure in this piece from how I've been kind of writing music for some time, um, which was much more, you know, obviously influenced by world music and things like that. So here I was just trying to get a little, to distill it down a little bit further, you know, to digest all those things and those, um, all those studies, take them into myself, and then just try to write in some ways just something that was about pure human existence. And, I guess a really rough situation it makes such a mark on us, it's kind of easy to, to do. And I actually have a, a thing that I kind of go by. And it's a, I have a tendency to write thing about things that I just find so horrible, I can't believe it, or so beautiful, I can't describe it. And the things in the middle, I don't seem to be too interested about when it comes to writing music, you know? So um, I actually find the beautiful thing harder in a lot of ways to be really, really eloquent with, you know, and not say, too much is difficult, yeah, really difficult. But, yeah. Okay. Other questions? I don't know what the time is, but. Uh, uh, we've still got plenty of time. Plenty of time? Um, uh, well, we've got uh, around about 15 minutes. I think I'll switch up and I think I'll play a shorter piece than the one I was going to play and uh, won't even say too much about it. So. So we won't need that any longer.
Sorry about this. Not sure exactly what folder it's in. We'll just do something else. <laughs> when I can't find it, I just you have to be adaptable. Um, so yeah, I think what I'll do is I'll play you a little bit of music that I based on the Japanese gagaku form, actually. So it kind of predates this piece by three or four years. And, um, but I think this was one of the first times where I started looking at that form. And those forms are set up into what are called collatomic structures. I don't know if you guys have heard of these, but it's basically a repeated series of you know, I can't remember the exact number in this uh, piece. So let's say I have 20 things. So I would have some significant marker, like in Javanese music or Polynesian music, it's a gong that happens on the first beat and sometimes the last beat. And in this one, I decided to compress that time, like I mentioned in this other piece. But I think this one is much more uh, obvious in what it does. And I also, used a little theme that I wrote that actually sounds quite like a bit of a gagaku theme, because I was, I was more experimenting with the idea of crunching time and density than I was the actual kind of materials in, inside of the actual uh, schematic of the collatomic cycle itself. So let me play it and then we'll check. <laughs> Not it. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's just a much shorter kind of example, but I think in this I was really working with form. But you can hear I, I now I listen to it again after years. It's always interesting to go back and listen. <laughs> I can hear myself dissecting like the instrumental sounds of gagaku and rearranging them on Western instruments and doing all kinds of things. So I must have had a method to my madness now that I think about it. But the real idea was you could hear it as it kind of compresses in and then re-expands out. So it was just some exploration. And so sometimes I think composers write pieces that are also experiments. And you have to experiment. It's like, you know, I believe in the freedom to fail, you know, and the freedom to fail is through experimentation. And if you don't do that, there's, it's impossible to go past the horizon, you know, or reach the horizon that you're looking for. So you have to, I don't, I don't uh, decry to have any answers whatsoever. I'm looking for answers. You know what I, mean? I think my work is the byproduct of looking for those answers. It's something that kind of comes off of my own dialogues with myself about being part of the universe or nature or however you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I so. ask you a question, Sean, about um, the, <clears throat> the fact that you do actually uh, you know, investigate other cultures, music, sure, yeah. music of other cultures. And I guess what I'm interested in is, first of all, how you deal with the appropriation issues, and then secondly, how do you go below the surface, especially if you're, you're um, working with materials from another culture that's not your own, how do you as the outsider get into the depth of what that's all about? Yeah, well, I think what I found out is that's not possible. And I think that's why my work departed from that from that stance. But what I found out was that being human and experiencing, you know, everything around us and interacting, those that's a common culture. So I think I've moved more towards those type of things in my understanding. But I have to say, that being said, the vehicle into looking at that was trying to look through the eyes of other cultures, trying to understand things from other cultural points. And I, that has been an absolutely invaluable experience in my life. There's nothing I am intrigued about more than going to some place I've never been before, no matter how far into whatever, you know, and scary a place it is, I love it. It's, it nothing kind of gets me uh, more joy and, and a bigger rush. But, um, so I love to have those experiences. And then I just write music. I don't, uh, so I, I guess I'm out of the appropriation game. I guess that's what I'm saying, <laughs> you know? But I think when I was young, I just always tried to do it by not directly stealing anything, by always trying to transform information and material, trying to just 
not just listen to music, but read philosophy and literature and poetry and look at art from cultures and you know talk to people from the cultures is always essential if you can, you know, I think. So, and interact and, and deal with them. But I don't, yeah, so I think it's, but that's a very personal uh, stance from me. I think other people are much better at it. So my teacher, Jin Ryung, well he is, he is East and West, he is Cambodian, but he was taught in America, so it's a much different if issue for him, right? So I'm Native American, but I wasn't raised Native American on a reservation or anything, so even that for me is a bit of a stretch to say that I have you know, the cultural right to kind of to, to uh, do that horizon. And there are plenty of composers of, you know, say Native American background who are doing just that, and that's, that's their task to do. So I've just, I think, departed from it and gotten into some different things. Uh, not out of an inability to come up with new ways to, to incorporate things. I still, I mean, certainly if you listen a bit between this piece, which is three or four years before the other one, there's still things I do. We have our fingerprints that we pick up along the way, and there's things about, I mean, I don't think I've ever written a piece that doesn't have some little bit in it that's influenced by Tibetan Buddhist chants because they're just one of my favorite musics ever. But just even sometimes the way I think about bowing the cello is more like, you know, a Gyoto monk than a cellist. But that's just in there now. I don't sit in there and go, oh, this is Tibetan monk music. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's just the way I hear mm -hmm. those sounds. And I think that's the point we have to get to for me yeah. is where it just becomes part of the fabric of who we are and we just write music that's about ourselves and is honest and is, you know, forthright and isn't just trying to be clever. And, you know, I mean, the, says something, speaks to other people. Yeah, that's a long answer. Sorry. No, that's a, that's a great answer. Um, would anyone else like to... Um, uh, Lu Ping, would you like to um, say any more? Or, no? He's okay. Uh, what about Chloe? <laughs> sure, I have another question. Was something sure. earlier that you said about generating the most out of the least. Mm, yeah. How do you try to maintain interest within the music? Oh, well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, and I think it goes back to actually one of the questions you were asking about the kind of style. And so when I think about generating the most out of the least, I think about, I think it stems from this, that I think a lot of times, particularly when I'm working with younger composers or I hear pieces that I'm kind of a bit unsatisfied with, it's because I get about nine thematic ideas and none of them have really been developed to the point where it's taken me on a narrative, right? It's, just, it's kind of presenting objects instead of presenting a narrative. So for me, the idea of using minimal material is to take something and transform it and take it through a narrative. Look, the, the easiest example in the book is the first movement of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Talk about someone who can take minimal material or a Bartok string quartet. He uses almost nothing, you know? But how does he transform? Well, he transform it through imagination. You transform it through processes that you build up. I mean, I have certainly techniques and things that I do. That I can say, oh, I can do this to it. I can expand it. I can contract it. I can invert it. Right. So those are the the, the, the techniques haven't changed really since the Renaissance, you know, in Western music, and and they exist in Southeast Asian music and all these other of these ideas. And then I think it's on. And then it comes to the idea for the piece. Like, so what the piece is, you know, what am I trying to achieve in the piece, or what am I thinking about, or what am I focusing on? And then I think of ways about how I can filter the material through, you know, just all kinds of different things. You know, I, I wrote a percussion piece where it was all based on death, kind of death ceremonies, but they all seem to tie into fire, water, air. So I started thinking about elements, and then I dug in a little bit about elements, and if you really read about what fire actually is, it's a pretty amazing thing in the physical world. So there's all these things that are going on. I say, so how can I filter music material through those types of things? So I'm always looking for avenues and, and new, I don't use the same set, I think of things all the time. I just, I call it distillation because I think that's more what we do with the material, we just kind of digest it and then come up with something new or run it through a set of filters that turns it into something else. Yeah. Answer the question? Yeah. Anyone? I think we have run out of time. I oh, no. There was a question I had, but maybe we'll, maybe we'll find another time later to talk about it. Yeah. Okay.
Well, I just want to uh, say thank you very much for coming and presenting your music and your ideas about music in this forum. I think that we've, um, you know, all of us have um, been incredibly enriched by it. So, oh, thank you so much. You know, thank you very much. Let's put yeah. our hands together. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to say thanks again to you and the other panel members. It's been great. I've never had a panel before. Actually, well, I'm going to talk, so I was a little intimidated by it, but it's been really nice. And, that it. and a big thanks to Bruce Crossman, uh, the great mate, for bringing me in. Can't thank you enough, Bruce. Thanks. Cheers. And thanks to all of you for coming. I appreciate it. And I think there'll day. be a, 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 a sort of a master class later on. So that's something in store, which will be really terrific. You'll be able to sort of really get into the nitty gritty in the masterclass. So thank you. Thanks, everyone.